um, here to talk about uh, Mark Cuban's Cost Plus drug company. You know, I should just preface this by saying around the same time of the notorious price increase that uh, got me in sort of uh, the media, Mr. Cuban and I shared some uh, unflattering words for each other. You know, that was seven years ago or so. So I don't really have an opinion on Mr. Cuban, you know, to have no axe to grind whatsoever, wish him all the best of luck in whatever he's doing. But I do know the business of pharmaceuticals and, and pharmacy and uh, generic drugs and distribution and all that stuff pretty well. You know, it's going to be interesting uh, to show you kind of behind the curtains what's what sort of takes place at uh, a company like this. I'm, I've actually been in litigation with Walgreens, so I'm certainly no fan of the retail pharmacy business. It's a cutthroat, very low margin business. Last quarter, Walgreens uh, operating margin was 3%. If you're new to business, 3% is a very, very low operating margin. Pharmacy is a really cutthroat business. 3% is, is, a, is a low margin. Last year, Walgreens operating margin was actually 2%. Uh, the gross margin is something like 20%. So I'm going to go through that uh, in a minute and talk about uh, how that's kind of what you, that's sort of the best case you have to work with in, in a business like this. Uh, there was a company that maybe is a little closer to to having a virtual pharmacy. It was called Diplomat Pharmacy, and there's many other specialty pharmacy companies. They had a gross margin of 5%, so even less to work with. So needless to say, any retail business is sort of um, has, a, has a tough time because of its, uh, its low gross margin. And in retail, it doesn't matter what you're selling. You're buying a product from somebody else and marking it up slightly. That's your business. And to get into that business is pretty difficult unless you can get a lot of volume. And we're going to talk about why Mark Cuban's company has a sort of a fatal flaw of not uh, really realistically ever being able to get any volume. I do think there are some one-off savings here and there, but I think there that the, my sort of research discovered that um, virtually uh, for, for 90% 90, 90 plus of the cases uh, from Mark Cuban's pharmacy, there are no savings. So it seems like there are one or two edge cases where uh, prices maybe of you know there may be a loss leader impact or something like that, but it doesn't see, seem to me to be a sustainable business model that will ever save anybody money in the long run. Uh, an operator can choose to lose money. Certain certain companies have done that well. I think Amazon is is somewhat of a good example. It's uh, not uncommon to be willing to lose money for publicity or for you know getting volume, a loss leader, so forth. You know uh, that could be what's going on. And again, we'll go through drug by drug examples of kind of what Cuban's up to or what his company's up to. And uh, again, you know, I'm I'm going to refrain from any ad hominem sort of discussion. You know, this isn't about him. This isn't about me. This is just about facts and and kind of what you know what the numbers show. There, there's sort of this you know animus towards you know pharmaceutical companies, no matter how you slice it. I've, I've always found this interesting. And maybe again, my view is myopic because I love the pharmaceutical industry and I think it does amazing things. But, you know, when you spend so much time in it, you can tend to have this sort of blinders on and tunnel vision and not see what everybody else sort of sees. And there's this perspective that, again, when I raised uh, pharmaceutical prices, or at least what it would seem like a large increase in pharmaceutical prices, and we, we won't go through my case in detail, but I think that was a, a narrative driven uh, sort of phenomenon more than, than, a, than a reality driven one. And I think that this is actually the polar opposite, where you have this sort of um, a tweet goes up or an article goes up by a journalist where, you know, uh, there's this sort of suggestion that prices are being lowered by Mr. Cuban dramatically or his company, I should say. And again, it's a narrative, not a fact driven sort of thing. And I think that it appeals to our emotions and our intuition. So, but not to, to our logic. So on the emotional perspective, it's always nice to, to hear about somebody getting a, a life-saving drug for a lot cheaper because there's this sort of internal outrage of, oh man, you know, if, if there's 99% off, everybody must have been being before the 99% price decrease. Thank you, Mr. Cuban, you're, you're a godsend. And of course, I'm going to go through why there's no 99% price, <laughs> price decrease to be found in healthcare, uh, especially not with Mark Cuban's site. Uh, that's a mirage. That's not true. It's a lie. Misleading enough to be sort of something I'd be worried about from a legal perspective. The average person doesn't, you know, want to be sort of a, a due diligence sort of data gatherer for something like this. The average person wants to believe. And, you know, it puts a smile on your face to hear that somebody's offering a medicine for 99% off. That sounds great. And it appeals to our emotions. And um, that's fine. And I think for 90% of people, that's fine. For the next 5% of people, I think that it appeals to our instinct. You know, you may not know pharmaceuticals uh, from, from your industry. Uh, most of us aren't in the pharmaceutical industry, even though we depend on it. But your instinct might tell you, hmm, well, you know, this is, seems like a fat margin business, um, you know, so good on him for, for finding a way to lower prices. And that would be wrong, too. 
you know, it's not just an emotional response, but the instinctual sort of, well, I, I bet that there is a lot of fat in this business. And I bet there's fat to cut and this guy's cutting it. That, that instinct will also fail you because that's not what's happening here. And the last 5% of people, maybe the people listening right now, want to look at this from a logical perspective. Okay, what exactly is happening? And, and, and why is this sort of uh, uh, the truth or not the truth? And again, I think that uh, the motivation here uh, is probably much more sort of oriented and not uh, um, sort of uh, savings oriented. And I think that there's uh, pretty ample evidence of that. And we'll go through that in a second. There's one way to get publicity for your pharmacy, which relies desperately on, on volume. I mean, this is a volume business. You can't make money without volume in pharmacy because your margins are anywhere from three to 10, maybe 20 or 30% in the best case on certain products. But on average, your margins are really low. Why? Because generic drug companies' margins are pretty low themselves. Uh, I've been in the generic drug business for a while as both an investor and an operator. And it's a really, really tricky, crappy business. <laughs> margins are really, really low, especially for sort of regular way U.S. products like Lipitor and Prozac and things like that. It's, it's really an abysmal business, to be honest. It's uh, gross margins can be quite low, um, pretty similar, in fact, to, to retail margins, which is amazing because the retailer only has to stock the product. Uh, we actually have to make the chemistry. Uh, make the finished product and so forth. So, you know, be regulated by the FDA and all that. So in any event, uh, that's sort of my general sort of sense of things. We're going to get into a more deep mathematical dive in all of this in a second. The generic drug business is, is very cutthroat. There's no barrier to entry whatsoever. You can make a generic drug for a million dollars. I mean, it's really a remarkable business. Uh, and there are people and plenty of stories. A good, a good one is Apotex. Uh, a very uh, enigmatic founder of Apotex started his generic drug company again with very, very modest means, ended up becoming a multi-billionaire, very fascinatingly also was, was murdered recently, uh, about five or six years ago. So a very interesting story and rabbit hole if you'd like to go down that. But again, you know, there, there are plenty of examples. Ivax by Phil Frost is another good one of people going from quote unquote zero hero generics with just a couple million dollars, starting out with one medicine using the profits from that medicine to make a couple more, et cetera, et cetera, you can sort of snowball a generic business into a great success. Now, the flip side of that is anybody can, can knock you off. So if, if you're, let's say there's a Merck drug and it's $10,000 a year and your generic comes out and it's $9,000 a year, um, well, that's great. But, you know, I can also make a generic for that Merck drug and now it's $4,000 a year because, you know, I have to knock off your your price of 9000 you weren't doing a great service to, to the world by pricing it there. And by the way, that's what 99% of generic companies do is they price it just below the, uh, the, the brand price because they know they'll get some conversion or quite a lot of conversion usually. And why give up margin when you don't need to? This is a sort of very tough business in the first place. So you don't want to give up an inch in margin unless you have to. So I would see that and say, okay, well, I'll spend a couple million dollars and I'll make my own generic. And then I'll come in, again, maybe not at 4000 maybe not at 5000 but something like six, seven, or 8000 Because most likely that first generic company who priced at 9000 will try to match me. Um, and so now we're going to split the market two ways. And again, as Chinese and, and uh, um, Indian companies sort of keep undercutting us, we're going to find our, our price ends up pretty close to our to our cost of goods sold. And that's that's a really brutal sort of place to be. You make a little bit of money for the first year or two if you're early, if you're smart. Uh, but in general, this stuff sort of tends to go to equilibrium, which which is what any econom economist would, would tell you would happen. And that's sort of what happens. And you can see this in uh, Micromedics' Red Book, uh, where, you know, Gleevec is a good example. So that's a great segue. Uh, maybe a minute later, I'll talk about Gleevec, which is the drug that Mark Cuban's cost plus drug company, fantastic name, um, seems to uh, herald as its sort of, uh, you know, masterpiece um, cost savings. And what's funny is that this is actually the, the rare, very rare example. And I would put it first if I were Mark Cuban as well. It's, the, it's probably the only drug I found where there's substantial savings. And I'm putting substantial in quotation marks. It's not the 99% that he's saying. It's sort of like half off roughly. I've sort of articulated why generic drugs is, is a really tough business because if you do have profit, everyone notices it. We all have the same database with IMS. We all have the same database with Redbook. We all sort of make spreadsheets and look for opportunities. It really doesn't cost uh, anybody much uh, to make a generic really quickly. And in fact, it's, it's sort of funny because the only problem is the lead time at the FDA. So if I see that, let's say, um, Sun Pharmaceuticals, which is India's biggest generic company, or Teva, uh, or Viatris, which was Mylan, any of those companies are, are sort of, you know, uh, eating, if you will, uh, big margins on, on a, a, say, an Ovartis drug or a Merck drug or a Pfizer drug, you know, it'll be 18 months to two years, maybe three years before I can jump in that market and undercut them. And that's the only sort of barrier to dropping prices. Otherwise, this market would be like 
a Walmart style market where price we'd have everyday falling prices. The reality is, you know, in that Merck example I gave, where Merck's price was ten thousand dollars a year, the generics, the first generic price was nine thousand. Well, I'd love to come in immediately at 8000 but it's going to take me two years, and it's going to take me a couple of million dollars before my drug is ready. And it's also going to take five or six other players. So there's this kind of game theory of, okay, well, should I start work on this thing? Because I don't know if my rival at Sun or Teva or Viatris is also going to start work on this thing. And if it's going to be six of us coming in for this $10,000 drug, prices are probably going to end up something like 2000 And if my cost of goods sold is 15000 uh, per course of therapy, and I can only charge two thousand. I just have to figure out if that's worth it, especially with six of us all kind of fighting for a very small amount of volume. So that's that's the generic drug industry. So now what what Cuban's sort of doing here is he's not he's not actually in the generic drug industry. He doesn't made any generic drugs yet. That's a laborious sort of scientific process that requires you sort of making raw chemicals, taking those raw chemicals, putting them into some kind of pharmaceutical form like a tablet or a capsule getting that regulated by the FDA, making sure that that product is the same thing as the brand product, and then entering this kind of like very cutthroat competitive market. He's not doing any of that, right? He's simply going to the companies that already do that and retailing their product. So just buying them. Uh, he doesn't have any volume sort of, you know, purchasing where he can say, I'm the big gorilla here. <laughs> like I want 20% off no matter what, or 50% off or more, right? That's what, what Walgreens and CDBS can do. He, he can't do that quite yet. He can probably participate in a buying group and, and get some of those discounts, but the reality is he's a newcomer to this, so he can't even get the prices that Walgreens and CVS can get. And their margins are, as I mentioned, really low. So it would be hard. I just can't understand how he could beat the pharmacies and stay in business. Again, if he wants to lose 10% margin, operate at a 20% negative margin for the next 10 years, he can do that. He can afford to do that. And uh, that's fine. It's not the kind of business I like to be in. But you know, again, we, we all have to decide you know, what we want to do with our time and our money. So for me, it's uh, running a money losing business uh, that doesn't really add anything uh, is is just as good as setting up a copay foundation. If he wants to help lower drug prices, he can he can have a he can put his fortune in a in a five one c three that just donates money um, to copays uh, assistance and and indigent patients. Uh, it'd probably be more effective than, than this method. So, in any event, uh, getting back to the point, being a pharmacy is 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 uh, is not that hard. You know, anybody can start a pharmacy. Uh, there are plenty of independent pharmacies in America. We tend to think of Walgreens and CVS as the two big players. They are the two big players, but there are dozens and dozens of, of small mom and pop pharmacies. Um, you know, you have to get a license, you have to employ a pharmacist. So again, 20% margins, think of that as sort of the high end of, of what a retail pharmacy can do. Uh, from there, you actually have to have a store. <laughs> that store is really expensive because you need the store in a high traffic area. You also need an accounting, HR, legal, all those functions in a corporate office somewhere. So it's a tough business. Um, it's a really razor thin margin business. Uh, they'll take margin where they can get it. So, you know, um, when you get a good buyer's discount at, in one of these buying groups of a generic drug, you sort of don't pass that along to the consumer very much. You kind of keep that for yourself. And that's where you can actually just stay in business. Without that, you'd be out of business. So it's a thing, as we know, e-tellers e sort of uh, eliminate that brick and mortar cost. And I think that's sort of a, a, a pretty cool business model. Amazon certainly worked for Amazon. And it may just work for, for this company. Um, again, I think the problem is, you know, what you replace by brick and mortar, you now have problems with sort of a digital infrastructure. You have to have a really solid digital infrastructure, which isn't cheap. Um, if you ever built sort of a, a production enterprise quality software company, you, you know what I'm talking about. It's very difficult to sort of uh, maintain and balance a, a really strong um, system. So there is cost to that that you may not have on, a, on the retail side. Uh, and then finally, the bigger thing is, is shipping costs. So um, we're going to peel back the, the layer of Cuban's pharmacy in a second. We're going we're to find that he doesn't include shipping costs in his uh, cost plus uh, uh, calculators. And I think that's really, really misleading. Again, you know, when you have a product that you can't get until you pay for it to come to you, and there's a base number, it's at least $5 under his system, but it's $15 if you want it express, um, you know, that's sort of misleading because a lot of these prices end up being pretty close uh, to being, you know, under 50 or under hundred dollars. Some of them are as little as six or $7. So having a five or $15 cost on top of that, you know, you're talking about, you know, misleading, uh, your customer in some cases, uh, sometimes more, um, and in some cases, you know, less like 20 or 30%, but it's still a really meaningful part of the cost calculation. And it's inconvenient. You know, there's a reason we go to the pharmacy, we can get our drug filled in 30, 30 minutes. We all can, we can also talk to a pharmacist, <laughs> a friendly face and ask them questions things like that. There's something really convenient about that, but you can't get these drugs same day uh, from Mark Cuban's company. 
Uh, I haven't ordered any medicine from our Cubans company yet. I'm planning on doing that and just sort of seeing how quickly they'll get filled. Um, I'm not an expert in logistics, but I, the, my hunch is that $5 doesn't quite cover a, a real-time delivery. It's a, a postal system that's uh, not so great. So I don't know if that's a two-day delivery or a week delivery or what exactly, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be very quick. Um, so in any event, I think that there's, there's sort of that uh, issue to contend with. So you may be able to beat the margins based on um, certainly not having brick and mortar uh, a brick and mortar location, but you also, again, trade off that inconvenience of having to do fulfillment and logistics. That's, you know, sort of complex. So again, can you have a five or 10% margin here? Surely it's possible, but I'm going to go into why, um, uh, that's, that's, uh, even still going to not be the case for this company. And I, I, again, I think that it's, it's unlikely to be a sustainable company in the long run. And my prediction, and this is sort of, again, not a high conviction one, just something that, you know, is just pops into my head, uh, is that I don't think this business will be around for the long haul. I think that uh, Cuban will exit it when he sees that there's no profit to be had. Uh, and this is a really tough cutthroat business where uh, he's not actually doing what he's promising or what he's saying he's doing, which is, is a dramatic cost saving. So with that said, let's go to Gleevec. And again, this is sort of the major big win. If you go to Mark Cuban's cost plus drug company website, I guess that's uh, costplusdrugs.com. You'll see that it's the very, very first um, example and you lead with your best, right? you're going to see that it's it's right on the front page. Imatinib, generic for Gleevec, 1440, retail price 250 Now, normally that sounds great. That's like a 99.5% roughly uh, discount from list uh, or from what this retail, quote unquote, retail price is. And that sounds amazing. It makes you feel good. It makes you, it's, it's your dopamine receptors in the right spot. And you, you feel like, oh, wow, what a good guy. Well, there's just one problem. <laughs> there's a gigantic lie on this, on this website. It says retail price 250 That's not the retail price. That's not even close to the retail price. And we're going to go uh, and see that in a second. But let's just click on on that and see see what's up. So we click on uh, this little uh, box that says Imatinib, generic for Gleevec, 1440 retail price 250 And you have this little all medications, Imatinib, Imatinib, Gleevec. You have this, you have this sort of brownish, orangish pill. This is Dr. Reddy's generic for Gleevec. So uh, Dr. Reddy's... Uh, Certainly doesn't discriminate as to who it sells to. You, you can probably even get get it straight from Dr. Reddy's if you wanted. Um, so it's it's to me difficult to understand what special sauce he's bringing to the table. It's just um, it's just sort of uh, a matnip. Uh, you can get it from anywhere. Any drug, com- any pharmacy can get this uh, straight from Dr. Reddy's. And I don't think Mark Cuban has the scale that he's getting some amazing special deal from Dr. Reddy's, uh, which is a, a great Indian drug company. So the funny thing about this price is that it's the wrong price as well. Uh, Imatinib is mostly taken in 400 milligram pills, not in 100 milligram pills. So go ahead and click the 400 milligram strength and you'll see that the price, of course, is much higher. It's $39 for a 30 count. Uh, Okay, so $39. That doesn't seem so bad, right? But we're not including, and if you scroll down here, that it says your drug cost with us, $39. You save $9,618.30 on your medication. This is more than a 99% discount. And it says manufacturing. And if you scroll down, there's this little... um, little dialogue where you can, or this little box where you can press an arrow to sort of see the four pieces. There's manufacturing, a markup, pharmacy labor, but then it's shipping and it doesn't include that. So this is a more than 10% additional cost. So we're up to $44. And again, I've not actually used this. So I don't know if that comes next day or a week later or a month later or what, but we've got 44 bucks. So I can, I, we can agree $44 is the price of this, at least prima facie, that that's what we're dealing with. But now I'd like you to go to goodrx.com. And head over to goodrx.com, and then on the top, just click that. Uh, or right away, you can just type in imatinib, I M A T I N I B. Beautiful drug, originally made by Novartis, life saving medicine, wonderful medicine. And you can see that GoodRx's lowest price is $88. And if you scroll down a little bit, you can see that um, several pharmacies have it for 88, 113, 116, some pharmacies I've never heard of. And then you have Walmart that has it for 130. Costco that has it for 136 and so forth. And you don't have any, uh, you know, anywhere that's selling it for $9,000. <laughs> um, if you uh, change the the dosage, uh, I have mine set for 400 milligrams, 30 tablets. So, uh, you know, again, Walgreens has it for 150, according to mine. So that's, that's sort of your competitor. I think it's really disingenuous to say, well, uh, um, the average sort of, uh, a drug like that is nine thousand dollars when Walgreens has it for one hundred fifty dollars. You know, it's it's really insane because there are over a dozen different Gleevec generics, and the only one that's nine thousand dollars is Novartis's original brand name drug, and that's when Novartis had one hundred percent sort of market 
uh, domination. They were the brand drug. They were still in their innovation period where they were recouping their costs. Uh, but once it goes generic, you know, everybody else drops the price dramatically. Uh, Cubans buying one of those drugs, marking it up seemingly for very little or even taking a loss on it. And that's all he's doing. And that's what every other pharmacy does. The only difference is he seems to be willing to take a substantial loss on this one medicine to attract a lot of attention. Again, Walgreens is pricing it at 150. If you go to Redbook, which requires a password, Redbook has uh, two suppliers of of uh, of Gleevec for $130. So the fact that retailers are selling it for 150 is not surprising. Now, here's where the things get really interesting. The average person is never going to use Mark Cuban's website. Why? Well, the average person has insurance in our country. In fact, 97% of people at Walgreens and CVS go to the pharmacy with an insurance card. 3% pay cash. Um, 93% of Americans have some form of healthcare insurance. Um, if you're an indigent, indigent patient, Medicaid should provide for you. Now, obviously, we know that there are people who are underinsured. There are people who um, are above the Medicaid uh, sort of limit of income, and they're still not quite doing very well financially. Uh, they might have a lot of obligations in the family. So if you're making thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars a year, you're still struggling, uh, and healthcare uh, is a serious cost for you if you're working part time, et cetera, et cetera. And again, there are resources available for for patients like that. Uh, sometimes they can't get them. It requires a lot of sort of red tape to get to some of those free drug and copay assistance programs and all those things. Uh, certainly, in my time in the drug industry, I bent over backwards to try to make sure those things were available. Not every company is that sort of you know forgiving and excited to to, to help. Um, I think that there's a there's a sort of expectation that the patient can do all this legwork, but the reality is it's often people working two jobs, single parents, things like that. Really tough sometimes to, um, you know, people who are disabled, people who have serious illnesses. Um, it's hard for them necessarily to, to actually uh, sign up for these programs and get the benefits. So I do think for those sort of five, and if you want to be really sort of, I guess, aggressive, you could say that as much, much as 10, 15, or maybe even 20% of America is kind of underinsured or uninsured. I think those are really gross overestimations, but um, let's stick with it uh, for, for this purpose um, of giving, giving some uh, sort of credit uh, to this product. So for, for the 20% of people that don't have uh, insurance, I think that, you know, this, this, website is attractive and competitive with the other websites just like it. And that's right. There are a number of websites just like this one. Uh, this isn't the first time somebody's had this idea of let's just buy medicine from generics and take the smallest markup we can and go ahead and, and supply that to patients. This wasn't Mark Cuban's idea. There are a number of, uh, of, of pharmacies just like this. Um, and guess what? Their prices are exactly the same as Mark Cuban's. There's no secret discount. So anyway, for the 80, 90, or even 93% of people who have insurance, Gleevec is free. It's at a zero copay or $5 copay. And um, it's a tier one generic. It's a life-saving medicine. No drug company in the world is ever going to ask you to pay a big copay for this thing because there's no alternative to it. Um, it's a, it's going to save the, the health insurance company a huge amount of money. If you don't take this medicine, they're going to have to pay for a bone marrow transplant or chemo or something like that. That's going to cost a fortune. So generic Gleevec is a no-brainer if you're Aetna or United Healthcare or any company like that. You really have, have zero reason to, to ever put a barrier in the way. You almost want to pay the patient to take his Gleevec or her Gleevec as soon as possible. So there's no incentive to putting a copay in there. And uh, from what I can tell, the diligence I've done, Gleevec is generally available at a $0 copay. So if you're, again, in that 7% to 20% that's underinsured and has a problem, this site could be a solution. But it's not a $9,000 savings. You're really looking at saving, again, for the $44 price we calculated and taking Walgreens $149, you're looking at a $100 savings per, per prescription per 30-month period, which is not a small amount of money. $100 can, can, can be a, a large amount of money, but it's not a $9,000 savings. I mean, I think Cuban and his people, they know that. Nobody's paying $9,000 for Gleevec. Nobody. Uh, there are 20 generic drug companies or so, 12 to 20 roughly from my eyeball of Micromedics and the FDA's website. Um, not every FDA generic is on the Micromedics uh, Red Book site. Uh, for example, Dr. Reddy's um, or, and a few others don't have their full pricing available on, on Red Book. But it's pretty clear to me that, that nobody's charging thousands of dollars for, for Gleevec, that it's, it's $100, $130, $150 in most cases.